Hello, everyone, and welcome to this second broadcast of a three-part webinar series that is being put on by the ACS Division of Polymer Chemistry. I'm Mike David, and I will be your host for today's broadcast, which will focus on how to design the next generation of sustainable polymers. We will be joined today by Megan Robertson, an assistant professor of chemical and biomolecular engineering at the University of Houston, as well as Steve Miller, an associate professor in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Florida. Our moderator today is Mark Hillmeyer, who is the chair of the Division of Polymer Chemistry, as well as a McKnight Presidential Endowed Chair of Chemistry at the University of Minnesota. If you have any questions or comments, you can enter those using the questions panel. The slides for today's webinar can be downloaded from that same control panel, and the recording will be posted on the Division of Polymer Chemistry's YouTube page. And now, I'm pleased to turn it over to Mark to get us started. Mike, thank you very much. It's really my pleasure and honor to not only uh, host this webinar series from the Division of Polymer Chemistry, but also to be the chair for uh, 2017. Uh, as you know, one of the big benefits of the Division of Polymer Chemistry is our outstanding technical program at national meetings, but not all of our members uh, can come uh, to national meetings every year. So uh, the division thought it would be a great idea to bring more of the uh, technical content to the poly membership in a more uh, 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 way that doesn't require any travel. And that's what started this poly webinar series. This is the second installment for uh, 2017. We're very excited uh, to be able to put this on for you. So for the division members who are online now, thank you for your membership. And we hope that uh, you find value in this, uh, uh, this webinar series. And for those of you online that are uh, not members, I'll just remind you that the first year of poly membership is free. And we encourage you to uh, become a member of poly and benefit from all the things poly brings uh, to its members. Uh, this is a topic that's very uh, near and dear to my heart today, sustainable polymers, and I'm very uh, happy and thankful and excited that we have uh, two outstanding presenters for this uh, webinar uh, series. We're going to have two uh, brief presentations. There'll be an intermission in between uh, the presentations, and then at the end, we'll take questions for all of the uh, for each of the both of the presentations. So uh, please do type in your questions. I'll be taking care of those and managing those for a question and answer session at the end of the second presentation. And with that, I'd like to now turn it over to our uh, first uh, speaker. As you heard, this is uh, Steve Miller, who's in the Department of Chemistry uh, at the University of Florida. Steve, it's all you. All right, thanks a lot, Mark. And thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, and thank you everyone uh, who's in attendance for taking time out of your busy summer to, to listen. I'll give you a couple of vignettes about our foray into making sustainable polymers. I am an organic chemist, I am a polymer chemist, and I'll also provide some of the reasons why we are inspired by this field. So I often present a seminar like this by explaining or uh, giving an image about the quantity of polymers that are made uh, on Earth synthetically uh, in a given year. And if you were to form those polymers into a sphere, it would easily tow over, tower over such uh, uh, buildings such as the, the Sears Tower or the Willis Tower. Um, there's quite a bit of material made. It's, it's well in excess of 300 billion kilograms per year of synthetic polymers, employing uh, at least 60 million uh, people worldwide. So I have a challenge question and uh, it reads something like this. How many people would actually fit inside of the sphere? Uh, would it be all Californians, all Americans, all European, all Europeans, or could we get 5 billion people inside of this giant sphere? All right, and this is a question we actually want to ask all of you, so you can click directly on the blue screen and let you let us know how many people you think would fit inside the sphere. And it looks like you guys are voting pretty quickly, so I'm going to be closing this in five, four, three, two, one. All right, and 45% uh, said 5 billion people, and then the rest were you know, between 16 and 24%. So what is the right answer? So the correct answer is most of the people on Earth, or about 5 billion of them, would fit, albeit uncomfortably, inside of this sphere. Um, another way of saying that is the mass of polymers made in a given year weighs about the same as 5 billion people. So it's uh, it's quite a large industrial uh, endeavor. Uh, of course, there are problems with these plastics. We enjoy them very much. We like our, our 
uh, our plastic bags, we like our plastic containers, we like our plastic spectacles. But uh, the vast majority of, of these, uh, uh, many of which are commodity polymers, high volume polymers, are made from fossil fuels, finite resources such as petroleum and natural gas. Moreover, at the end of their life, they tend to contribute substantially to the trash crisis. So this is an, an ongoing problem because the polymers have relative or extremely uh, slow rates of degradation. So what does happen to this 300 plus billion kilograms of plastic per year? Well, uh, some are recycled, some are incinerated uh, to gather energy. Uh, many make it to a landfill. If you look at where the polymers end up, about 30% of them uh, go to destinations unknown. And so it's not exactly clear where those go, but some of that material certainly makes it into the open ocean. There have been a number of studies lately that, that describe the quantities of plastics that are now floating or otherwise in our, in our oceans. And there are these garbage patches, um, a famous one in the, in the North Pacific, and uh, a, a new number that describes how much polymer has been making it to the ocean. It was published recently at about 8 billion kilograms per year. And this equates to 15 tons per minute of plastic being added to our our oceans. So one of the objectives in my research group is to try to make some of these polymers a little more water degradable. Biodegradation can be good if you have enough biology uh, in the vicinity of the plastics to degrade the polymers, but many of our polymers are designed simply to degrade in water. Uh, of course, we don't necessarily want this to be a fast process, but a process that is on the order of our addition of the plastics to the oceans may be degradation occurring in, in uh, one to 10 years, something like that. So that article uh, <clears throat> mentioned on the previous slide men, uh, noted that there are over 5 trillion pieces of floating plastic in the ocean. I, I happen to think that is an underestimate. Uh, the Washington Post uh, poked fun at us and said, good job humans. But then again, the Washington Post, of course, wraps many of their newspapers in low density polyethylene, which of course contributes to the aforementioned problem. I liken this problem in some ways to what's visualized here, and that is the ozone hole. The ozone hole had been a problem for, for many years, uh, but it was a uh, fairly understandable chemistry, which allowed us to uh, stop um, or at least arrest this problem so that it wouldn't, um, uh, wouldn't uh, get worse. Unfortunately, in my opinion, the plastics problem, uh, both their source and their, uh, and their trash crisis, is probably a larger problem um, that will take uh, a little more effort than uh, the correction of the, uh, of the depleting ozone hole. So in my group, we have this overarching goal. We want to make new sustainable packaging plastics. We would like them to originate with renewable starting materials. We would like them to be degradable, maybe on the order of a decade. Um, Chemists are pretty good at doing those two things. Perhaps the, the biggest challenge is making them inexpensive, so, such that they can economically compete with polyethylene, polypropylene, polystyrene, which are very inexpensive polymers uh, on the order of a dollar per pound. That seems to be maybe the largest challenge. Perhaps the most successful green or sustainable plastic that's out there is PLA, polylactic acid. Uh, most of this material comes from corn, uh, from the state of Nebraska, where the starch is decomposed into glucose. The glucose is fermented to lactic acid. The lactic acid is ultimately uh, polymerized to polylactic acid, constituting one of these uh, cups, which you probably have gotten at uh, one of your local restaurants. So here is an image of my student uh, putting hot water into a PLA cup, and you can see that it doesn't do very well. It undergoes plastic deformation. The softening temperature, in this case, the glass transition temperature of PLA is about 55 degrees. And so it undergoes very facile um, plastic deformation with hot water that might be 60 or 70 degrees Celsius. Polystyrene, as you can see also from this video, does fine. Its glass transition temperature is much higher at about 95 or 100 degrees. This leads me to my second challenge question, which is uh, about PLA. And the question is, how long does it take polylactic acid to compost in a Floridian swamp? You can see right here on this cup, it's advertised as compostable. So would it take this cup, uh, say, thrown into my backyard, three months to degrade, one year to degrade, three years to degrade, or maybe it doesn't degrade? And you can see, um, according to this climate graph, um, 
it's warm in Florida where I live, and we get about 50 inches of rain per year. All right, so once again, you can just click directly on the blue screen to let us know what your response is. Um, and while you're doing that, just a reminder that we are eager to get your questions, so don't be shy about asking them. And there's no need to wait until the end of the presentation. The earlier you ask your questions, the better of a chance we have to get to your particular one. So with that, I'm going to close this poll in five, four, three, two, one. Well, Steve, uh, about 46% of the audience said three years, and the next highest, 27%, said it does not degrade at all. So who was right? So as an experimentalist, uh, my current answer is that it does not degrade. Uh, these are videos taken after two years, and then after three years of this cup, it's sitting in my backyard. You can see many things are growing in and around it, uh, but the cup doesn't seem to be changing at all. I checked the cup last night. Um, it's been in my backyard for almost five years, and the cup looks essentially as it did a couple years ago. There's no significant change in the cup um, in about five years. So the problems with PLA are, um, are as follows. It is uh, derived from a food-based feedstock, so we use starch and, and edible material in, instead of um, to make this plastic. It has the low deformation temperature. Uh, and it has much slower degradation than, than what is originally advertised. In fact, if you look at a cup nowadays, it often will say something like industrially compostable, which means you need a little more temperature and uh, some microbes added to the system to actually get this to compost in a reasonable time frame. So this brings me to one of our first forays into this area where we attempted to mimic uh, the structure and properties of polyethylene terephthalate, of course, known as water bottle plastic um, or Gatorade plastic. So what we wanted to do was to mimic the structure as much as we could, but to use biogenic feedstocks to do so. We also had some other monomer design criteria that we thought we could uh, investigate uh, because we were starting essentially from scratch. So instead of having an AABB copolymerization system, we thought maybe we could uh, uh, address our stoichiometry issues by having a single AB monomer for polymerization. We wanted uh, an aromatic unit in the polymer main chain, uh, but instead of deriving that from fossil fuels, we wanted to get it from nature. We wanted there to be a short aliphatic segment in the repeat unit, and this would probably ensure some tractability of the polymer. Uh, and then finally, more perhaps a more subtle point is instead of using an aliphatic alcohol to make the ester bond, we wanted to use an aromatic alcohol. Uh, the reason being for that is that aromatic esters tend to hydrolyze one to two orders of magnitude faster than aliphatic esters, at least according to small molecule analogs. So looking at to what nature actually provides, um, vanillin is an aromatic molecule that is uh, uh, that is made uh, in, in pretty large amounts, about 15% of the world's vanillin flavoring, and yes, it is the world's most abundant flavoring, about 15% of it comes from uh, Norwegian spruce uh, at paper pulping facilities operated by Beauregard, and they can decompose lignin, uh, and about 1% of the lignin material gets converted into vanillin. Another abundant aromatic that we've used is called ferulic acid. Uh, this comes from rice bran and rice bran oil, and we, we buy this from Alibaba.com. It's about $100 to $200 per kilogram. The vanillin, by the way, we paid $800 for 25 kilograms. So in, as far as an academic lab, we can buy uh, reasonable quantities of this material, but it's, um, it's not exactly where we need it to be in, in, in the long run. So you, starting with either vanillin or ferulic acid, we can get to our target monomer. And if you look in the very center of this page, you see this monomer dihydrofrulic acid, and you see its similarity to the sort of hydrolyzed repeat unit of PET. So dihydrofrulic acid is a hydroxy acid. It has an aromatic, and it has two sp3 hybridized carbons in its, in its structure. Hydroxyethylene terephthalate is very similar. Um, as drawn, it is also a hydroxy acid, and it also has two sp3 hybridized carbons in the backbone. So our rationale was that if we were to make a polymer from this dihydrofrulic acid, we could have properties quite similar to those of PET. If we attempt the direct Fischer esterification of dihydrofrulic acid, it simply doesn't work. We get oligomers at best. But we were able to acetylate 
this monomer, um, either with uh, acetic anhydride or as a consequence of the, of the Perkin reaction that's followed along this, this top pathway. And acetyl dihydrofrulic acid was quite successful in, in its polymerization. Um, in this case, we are actually conducting a transesterification polymerization using a zinc acetate catalyst with the evolution not of water, but of acetic acid, um, which is apparently a little bit easier to remove by vacuum. And we can get to acceptably high molecular weight polydihydrofrulic acid that uh, look like nice white powders in general. We, of course, looked at the thermal properties of, the, of this material. We saw that the glass transition temperature was uh, about 73 degrees. Um, we see numbers closer or, or maybe in, in the higher 70s now for a, high, a slightly higher molecular weight material. But nonetheless, we were able to slightly beat the glass transition temperature, glass transition temperature for, for polyethylene terephthalate. You can see here that the melting temperature is a little bit lower than that of PET, maybe 30 degrees lower. Uh, I'm told that that is fine because uh, that will cover most potential applications, but allows for a more processable polymer. Uh, these properties caused us to, to draw this little graphic that hints at the possibility of taking wood or wood byproducts, in this case vanillin, and transforming them into this polydihydroferulic acid polymer. So a TG of 73 is good. That was a certainly a good starting point because we're able to mimic essentially PET. But what about polystyrene? Polystyrene is, was our, our next goal. And of course, uh, to mimic that, we would like a glass transition temperature of around 100 degrees. So the polymer chemist would look at this and say, well, that's easy. Instead of hydrogenating completely your monomer, leave some of the double bond present. This uh, would allow you to increase the rigidity of the polymer main chain, and we would expect a, a higher glass transition temperature. In fact, that is exactly what happens. Um, as you increase the double bond content in the copolymerization between the ferulic acid monomer and the hydrogenated variant, you uh, quite nicely increase the glass transition temperature of the copolymer. Uh, glass transition temperatures as high as about 155 can be achieved if the polymer only has the unsaturation in the backbone. And if you make the copolymer that is about a 50-50 mix of these two, that is 50% hydrogenated and 50% with the double bond. In that case, the TG is pretty close to that of polystyrene, right around 95 to 100 degrees. So the question might be, well, what happens to this polymer if and when it degrades? And it, in fact, turns back into ferulic acid or hydrogenated ferulic acid, both of which are abundant, very abundant chemicals uh, in nature. Um, this is, perhaps you can hear that, that is a bottle of trans ferulic acid um, that I purchased as, as a vitamin supplement. Um, it has many general antioxidant properties. Um, it has a structure somewhat similar to that of vitamin E, although it is certainly less fat soluble. Um, and a number of other positive health benefits have been reported for ferulic acid itself. So the degradation products of this polymer would not just be benign, but in fact, they would probably be beneficial to, to human health. We also realize that nature not only gives us ferulic acid, but it gives us cumaric acid, which is very similar to ferulic acid, except that it lacks that methoxy group. Um, so this is another molecule that we've been uh, working on quite a bit in, with our copolymerization studies. And therefore we have copolymerized ferulic acid, dihydrofrulic acid, cumaric acid, and dihydrocumaric acid. So amongst those four separate monomers that we can consider, there are six pairwise copolymerizations that are possible. We noted that if the polymer has no hydrogenated components in the backbone, that it's a fairly intractable material, so those data are not reported here. If, as in the case of this purple polymer, uh, we use both hydrogenated frulic acid and hydrogenated cumaric acid, the polymer remains fairly flexible and glass transition temperatures never really uh, get much larger than 85 degrees Celsius. However, for the other four pairwise copolymerizations, we see the trend we just saw on the previous slide, wherein an increase in the double bond content in the backbone leads to a general increase in the glass transition temperature. So this seems to be a fairly controllable parameter. And in large part, it doesn't matter a great deal whether we use ferulic acid or cumaric acid as the monomer uh, to polymerize. 
So this leads me to another question. I don't think we actually have a poll for it, but the challenge question is as follows. What is the world's largest crop? So I guess there are 29 separate answers on here, which is what, when I Googled this question, it, it gave me 29 pictures. And I will tell you that the answer is here, but um, most things actually get this wrong. So you might think it's corn or wheat or even potatoes. Um, in truth, the most abundant crop produced on earth is sugarcane. The amount of transported sugarcane per year is 1.8 trillion kilograms. This is approximately double the amount of transported corn kernel per year. So corn is typically named as the most abundant crop. It is if you consider the edible component. The transported sugarcane in totality is not edible, but about 13% of the sugarcane can be extracted or pressed for the sugar itself. Um, so as far as transported agricultural material, sugarcane is number one. It also means that it is the largest agricultural waste because at these individual sugar mills, piles and piles of sugarcane bagasse accumulate and they're essentially burned for energy. You can see in this picture in the upper right, this is uh, what I believe to be the world's largest sugar mill. It is in Southern Florida. Um, and this field here, this brown field that you see is uh, sugarcane bagasse. That is about an 18 football fields worth of sugarcane bagasse. And this particular sugar mill produces about 1.2 million tons of sugarcane bagasse per year, uh, which is quite a bit. Uh, this cover graphic here shows a picture I took of that pile of bagasse. Maybe a little bit hard to tell, but it's about 10 meters tall. And during the peak of the season, it grows and then they burn it for energy and it, and it shrinks again. So what would you get if you were able to successfully extract all of the ferulic acid out of the world's supply of sugarcane bagasse? Well, if you look at the literature uh, value of ferulic acid, how much of it is supposed to be in the sugarcane bagasse, it's about two and a half percent. <clears throat> um, as a tall monocot, as a tall grass, uh, sugarcane bagasse uh, does have a lot of ferulic acid and camaric acid in its uh, lignocellulose. But if you were to have successfully extract all of that at the literature reported value, you might end up with over 9 billion kilograms of ferulic acid. To put that in perspective, if you were to polymerize all of it successfully and begin to replace water bottles, you might approach replacing half of the world's water bottles. So this could be a good start. Um, if you're able to find a comparable amount of kumaric acid in there as well, you might be able to replace all of the world's water bottles. So that is just a, a possibility. Of course, there'd be a lot of engineering to figure out exactly how to do that. Um, and some people are looking into it. So this leads me to uh, the second vignette that I will talk about, uh, second to last vignette uh, about some polymers in my group. And the challenge question is as follows. What is the most abundant polymer functional group linkage? And by way of a hint, I will tell you that nature far surpasses humans in terms of polymer production. So knowing that, you need to tell me whether the most abundant polymer functional group linkage on Earth is an ester, an amide, a carbon-carbon bond, an acetal, or an ether. All right, and once again, you can click directly on the screen to let us know what you think the correct answer is. And I will be closing this in five, four, three, two, one. Well, uh, the highest percentage of the audience, 34%, said it was carbon carbon. Uh, amide came in second with 24, and none of the rest climbed out of the teens. All right, so this was, uh, an, the answer to this question, it has inspired my research group for the last couple of years. Um, of course, the most abundant polymer on earth is cellulose. About 50% of all organic polymer is in the form of cellulose, um, and this quantity far exceeds what, what humans are capable of producing. Uh, starch also is a poly sugar, but both cellulose and starch employ the acetal functional group linkage, that is the Sugar units are connected by this oxygen-carbon-oxygen -oxygen linkage. Um, the chemistry for this is is uh, is uh, is utilized by biogenic systems. Um, and our rationale was, well, if nature can make this and put it back together easily, perhaps synthetic chemists can also. But when you look for synthetic polymers, 
that rely on the acetal functional group for their either their main chain or, or side chain chemistry, there, there are not that many examples. The organic chemists will recognize polyoxymethylene in, in the form of these Keck clips as a, as a, as a material. Uh, it's made out of, uh, that it relies on this acetal functional linkage. Turns out the polyoxymethylene is so hydrophobic that it, it doesn't undergo uh, degradation even in strong acids. It's kind of an unusual polyacetal. Polyvinyl butyral is another material that's used in a number of film applications that employs the acetal linkage, albeit on the side chain. So we, we were very interested in this idea of, of, of looking at polyvinyl butyral, uh, knowing that industrially it comes from polyvinyl alcohol. So polyvinyl alcohol is contacted with butyraldehyde and about 80% of the OH groups are converted into acetal functional groups. And when this polyvinyl butyral is formed, um, the glass transition temperature doesn't change drastically. It stays somewhere in the 70s, 60 to 70s in fact. A uh, very common application for polyvinyl butyral because of its clarity and toughness is to be used as an inner layer for various uh, glass applications. So we looked at this and said, well, if we want to make a packaging plastic out of this, how are we going to make this kind of polyacetal that would give us a higher glass transition temperature? Remember, one of our goals is a TG of about 100 degrees Celsius. So we just threw at it our favorite bioaromatic vanillin, which of course we have plenty of, because remember we bought 25 kilograms of it. So we threw vanillin at polyvinyl alcohol, in this case in excess, uh, in a sealed tube, in an NMR. Um, and under these conditions, after about 17 hours, we can watch the progress of the acetalization. It starts out uh, somewhat fast, but over the course of 17 hours, it seems to maximize at around 71% conversion of the OH groups to the acetal functional group. Um, quite nicely, when we make separate samples of this material, the glass transition temperatures are high. It's about 142 degrees Celsius, far surpassing uh, our dreams of, of 100 degrees Celsius, which would allow us to compete effectively with, with polystyrene. So of course, we didn't stop at vanillin. We threw every aromatic aldehyde we could get our hands on at polyvinyl alcohol. And this allowed us to make this particular graph. So polyvinyl alcohol is down here with a glass transition temperature of 75 degrees. Um, when we throw vanillin at it, we get a higher glass transition temperature of 142, as I mentioned. Um, typically, we get acetalization extents in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. The polyvinyl alcohol that we employed for most of our studies was commercial and it had a molecular weight of number average molecular weight of about 22,000. And so by adding uh, uh, aldehydes to this, we could in some cases double our molecular weights. There's some trends we can dig out of this some structure property relationships. In general, what I'll tell you is that if the aromatic bears an OH group as it did for vanillin, uh, as it does for uh, hydroxymethylfuorfural, if it still bears an OH group, apparently that OH group is active in, in uh, hydrogen bonding and leaves us with relatively high glass transition temperatures, somewhere in the 140s to 150s typically. Aromatics that lack that hydrogen bonding typically gave us lower uh, glass transition temperatures. We also did a side study where we purchased uh, rather high polyvinyl alcohol. A sample we bought had a molecular weight of 166,000. And when we made the corresponding polyvinyl acetal with vanillin, the glass transition temperature was only marginally higher than that for the lower molecular weight polyvinyl alcohol. So in terms of degradation, we were very interested in how these things might degrade, knowing that the acetal functional group is, is sensitive to water and, and, uh, and acidic, acidic media. So we threw some sample of, uh, of our vanillin-based polyacetal into various aqueous solutions. So here we have deionized water, seawater, pH 1, 2, and 3. You can see after just two hours, the polymer that we threw into the pH 1 aqueous solution had essentially disappeared. So this is a, a probably a, a hydrolysis and dissolution phenomena. We can monitor this by NMR as well. And we find that when we uh, expose our polymer to uh, increasing pH, so highest pH is at the bottom of this graph, we only have a, a residual acetalization of about 1% after 24 hours. 
with both pH 5 and deionized water, there, uh, the, the level of acetylization uh, didn't seemingly change. It stayed at about 54%, at least during this relatively short experiment. But we have other data that, that suggests that uh, even uh, some of these neutral solutions are capable of slowly hydrolyzing uh, the acetyl linkage, uh, certainly not as fast as, as pH 1, 2, or 3. So um, our general strategy was to take polyvinyl alcohol, which is touted actually as a fairly benign polymer. It's a biodegradable polymer. If you use the little dish, dish packets in your dishwasher or your wash machine, those are essentially um, water-soluble polyvinyl alcohol. We uh, expose those to bioaromatics. We append uh, some kind of bioaromatic to it. We drastically increase the glass transition temperature. And then in, under certain conditions, this will hydrolyze back to a relatively benign, in fact, sometimes tasty uh, bioaromatic, as in the case of vanillin, and polyvinyl alcohol, which is something that, uh, again, is fairly uh, inert to people and animals. You might ask, well, where on earth um, would this polymer be useful if it takes a pH of one or two for this hydrolysis to occur with any rapidity? And the answer to that is that this bird would have been very thankful if he had eaten only our polymer. Uh, the pH of a bird's stomach tends to be around two. And so if he had eaten exclusively this particular polymer, it would have gone into his gut. And after a day or two, it probably would have uh, decomposed completely to a small molecule vanillin and water soluble polyvinyl alcohol. It would have passed through his system and uh, not led to his uh, apparent demise. So there are certainly uh, applications or specific uh, places on earth where this type of polymer would be useful, where uh, under normal circumstances it has a long life, but in say the gut of just about any animal, it has a short lifetime and can degrade into uh, non-mechanically uh, important materials, uh, water soluble and benign materials. So this just leads me to a conclusion slide. Uh, I will mention that plastics is, of course, an enormous industry. It's well over a trillion dollars per year for the economic uh, uh, output. About a third of that, about, so maybe $400 billion, is what we would call short-term packaging applications. A lot of those are uh, used uh, just for a matter of uh, days or months. The green component or sustainable polymer uh, packaging industry is still relatively small if you exclude certain things like biopolyethylene and some of the others, it, it's lingering around 1% of, of, this, of this larger quantity. This is allowing this industry to grow um, at rates that are approaching 20% per year. It is already a, a worldwide multi-billion dollar industry and will only grow by the billions uh, year by year. So today, I guess I impressed upon you some, uh, some vignettes from our research uh, where we in particular employ bioaromatics to control thermal properties to attempt to match uh, important uh, uh, mechanical and, and, and thermal properties, specifically glass transition temperature for plastics such as polyethylene terephthalate or polystyrene uh, beating polylactic acid in, in most cases. And then I touched a little bit on the water degradability. I certainly showed you some examples of polymers that degrade under acidic conditions, but our research group has published a couple of other examples where water degradability uh, certainly works in, in regular seawater, neutral pH, uh, sometimes even in, even in humid air, we've seen degradation occur on the order of, of a year. So that summarizes some of the science of what I'll talk about. This of course leads me uh, to thank the students who've worked on this. Uh, the names of the authors were uh, on, on the previous slides. Uh, this was my group at the beginning of the year. In particular, I have to thank the National Science Foundation, who has uh, funded a lot of my work in sustainable polymers, and in particular, using bioaromatics to make uh, sustainable polymers. And then I will put also uh, up this list of references in case you want to refer to uh, some of our prior work and the work of others. Thanks again for your time. And uh, after Megan speaks, I'd be happy to answer questions that you might have. Steve, thank you very much. Uh, outstanding uh, and interesting uh, material uh, for sure. We have been generating a number of questions uh, from your presentation, which I, as you said, we'll address at the end. 
of Megan's um, uh, presentation. I also want a special thanks for that audio special effect, the first ever in a poly webinar series of the ferulic acid. I like that very much. Uh, this is to remind you also that um, these uh, webinars will be archived on the brand new uh, Division of Polymer Chemistry YouTube channel. Uh, so you can go watch it again or tell your friends uh, that you liked it and they can go to the YouTube channel and, and hear this whole uh, presentation, set of presentations. Uh, also, uh, the third installment is targeted for November 14th of this year. Uh, the speakers aren't confirmed yet, but we welcome, I particularly welcome your uh, suggestions for topics or speakers that you think might be particularly good for the Poly uh, webinar series. We're going to move right to our uh, second presentation, and this is from uh, Megan Robertson. Uh, she's from the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at the University of Houston. Uh, Megan, you're on. All right. Thank you so much for the introduction and also for the opportunity to speak in this webinar. Today, I'd like to talk to you about vegetable oils as a feedstock for polymers. And in particular, I'd like to highlight what I think are some of the attractive features of vegetable oils and give some examples from our laboratory, as well as discuss some challenges and how we're looking to overcome them. But first, I always like to mention that I think there are many ways that we can think about sustainability and how it applies to polymer science. Uh, looking at a sustainable resource is certainly the first step, but regardless of the source, we can think about things such as reducing waste, reducing energy requirements, avoiding toxic byproducts, providing alternative end-of-life options, uh, such as composting or degradation, and even increasing the service life, which also is a way of reducing waste. And so in this way, uh, we can have sustainable materials from a variety of different sources. It turns out that looking at the agricultural and biorenewable sources for polymers is not a new field. And in fact, uh, Com people at companies and, and, at, and at universities have been looking at these types of feedstocks for decades, and natural rubber as a, as a material has been used even as, for centuries. So this is a question for all of you in the audience. Uh, which company in the 1940s worked on the development of plastics from soybeans? Was it Boeing, Procter & Gamble, Ford, or Whirlpool? All right, and uh, thank you for so much for submitting those answers. And they are coming in quick, so I'm going to close this poll in five, four, three, two, one. All right, it turns out that uh, it was Henry Ford was a great proponent of the use of soybeans for components of his automobiles. And this is a picture from 1941, in which he's showing the reporters how strong the bumper is on this car. All right, when we think about renewable resources for polymers, there are a diverse array of possibilities. And of course, this uh, slide is not comprehensive. But uh, things such as plant sugars, we've heard a little bit about polylactide. Uh, lignocellulose, the most abundant resource uh, on the planet. Uh, oils which I'll, from vegetables and, and algae, which I'll discuss more in detail in this talk. Plant terpenes, such as natural rubber. And even microorganisms, which produce uh, polymers for energy storage, such as these polyhydroxyalkanoids. In developing biorenewable materials, there are a number of challenges that we must think about before they can be implemented. Uh, for example, regarding synthesis, they might be non-traditional monomers, they might be ill-defined feedstocks, uh, their physical interactions and morphology may be distinct from traditional materials. We might have the presence of uh, non-traditional atoms, such as sulfur or silicon, uh, perhaps a high abundance of oxygen compared to hydrocarbons. Uh, their physical properties may be different than conventional materials, and therefore they may not be drop-in replacements. And so it is important to characterize the relationships between their structure, property, and function in order to use these new materials. So today I'm going to focus on vegetable oils as a source, and you can see the general structure of a triglyceride oil on the slide. The R groups, R1, R2, and R3, are derived from fatty acids. And in each oil, uh, there's an average fatty acid composition. So each molecule is not necessarily exactly the same. And that fatty acid composition differs when looking at one oil versus another. You can see some of the common unsaturated fatty acids on the slide on the right-hand side. And of course, there are fully saturated fatty acids as well. Generally, there's around uh, anywhere in the range of 10 to 22 carbon atoms per uh, alkyl chain in a fatty acid. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the features of oils in this talk and uh, highlight some of the work from our group, 
uh, in utilizing oils as feedstocks for a diverse uh, range of polymers, ranging from thermoplastics to elastomers uh, to thermosets. So first, uh, I'll mention that the functionalization of oils is one of their uh, most desirable qual qualities and that there are many ways to functionalize them to produce monomers and subsequently polymers. Uh, just showing some examples on this slide, there are really too, uh, too many uh, routes that they're too numerous uh, to mention all here. But oils could be epoxidized, oxidized, uh, they, we could form cyclic monomers, we could undergo metathesis chemistry, they can be acrylated, and, and many more. And uh, I should mention on the previous slide, when we look at the fatty acids, the fatty acids can be converted to methyl esters and even alcohols. And so the oils themselves or these derivatives of oils can all serve as a platform for deriving new materials. So in our lab, we're really interested in the idea that the uh, alkyl chain length on the fatty acid uh, can vary in its, in its length, and that this can be a route to creating polymers with tunable properties. And so we've underwent a study uh, looking at polyacrylate monomers, which are derived from uh, steric and lauric acid uh, to form sterile acrylate and laurel acrylate, respectively, uh, which are, are then uh, copolymerized to form uh, polyacrylates with tunable properties. And uh, these long chain polyacrylates are not a new uh, material. They've been studied uh, in the past. And this is a, a nice uh, data set from Don Paul's group at UT Austin, where they show that uh, the side chain length of a polyacrylate in this large length range, where the number of carbon atoms ranges, say, from 10 to, to 22, can uh, vary over almost 100 degrees Celsius. Uh, and in our case, we looked at an alternative approach, which is to copolymerize these two monomers, which have differing side chain lengths. And we can see that that melting, is, melting temperature is easily varied, as is the zero shear viscosity of the polymer above its melting point. So the physical properties can be varied quite easily through changing the length of that alkyl chain or through copolymerization of diverse monomers. And one question we asked was, how does the length of that alkyl chain uh, the alkyl, which is now an alkyl side chain on the polyacrylate, affect thermodynamic interactions in a polymer mixture. Uh, and the thermodynamics of polymer mixtures are governed by parameters such as the flory huggins interaction parameter chi, the degree of polymerization of the polymer, and also the composition of, of the mixture. And the, how does that chi parameter impacted by the length of the alkyl side chain? So we looked at a model system, which is a blend of polystyrene and the poly and alkyl acrylate where we used either polylaurel acrylate or polysterol acrylate. And we found, uh, we, we were able to generate an experimental phase diagram for each binary blend. Uh, through the use of Floyd Huggins theory, we could then extract the temperature dependence of the interaction parameter chi. And we found, regardless of the choice of polyacrylate, that this chi of T behavior uh, was the same. And so the length of that side chain on the polyacrylate did not impact the chi parameter in these mixtures. Uh, just one more look at this, we can look at the solubility parameter of uh, polyalkyl acrylate as a function of the alkyl chain length n, and you can see it decreases with increasing chain length, uh, a side chain length that is. Uh, and if we use that to predict the chi parameter of this blend, we find there should be a minimum at a relatively low alkyl chain length. Uh, however, uh, when we look at the literature, again, a study by Don Paul, we find uh, he, he showed that at uh, moderate uh, chain length sizes, there was a plateau in this chi parameter. And using the results of our study, we find uh, that indeed this, uh, the chi parameter does not vary at long chain length for these mixtures. Uh, so this is very interesting because we can use the, the side chain length as a route to tune polymer properties without impacting uh, interactions. Uh, one more implication of this would be if we look at something like a block copolymer in which the self-assembly is also governed by the same thermodynamic uh, parameters, chi, the chain length, and the, and the composition. And in this case, uh, the, the order to start a transition will, uh, the value of chi n at the order to start a transition, which is also known as the interaction strength, will vary with the polymer composition. So knowledge of the temperature dependence of chi allows us to predict the order to start a transition temperature. In the case of these uh, polyacrylate-based polymers, we, made, we synthesized a tri-block copolymer in which a soft, a, the soft middle block was a random copolymer of sterile and laurel acrylate, and the glassy end blocks were in polystyrene. And uh, this, uh, this is a thermoplastic elastomer, as you can see, 
the movie on the slide, uh, is, is easily processed above the order to sort of transition temperature of the polymer and is a sphere forming polymer at low temperatures. Uh, so in this uh, tri-block copolymer, we looked at the order to sort of transition temperature with rheology. And you can see the, the high modulus in the ordered state, which upon heating transitions to a disordered material. And in each series on the plot, the polymer composition in terms of the block ratio and molecular weight were held constant. And the only thing we changed was the composition of the mid block in terms of the percent laurel acrylate and percent sterile acrylate. And we found that that ordered sort of transition temperature did not vary with the mid block composition. As expected, due to the temperature independence, or sorry, the, um, the side chain length independence of that chi parameter. Uh, and this brings me to a challenge in working with these long chain polyacrylates. The very long side chains uh, result in the fact that they have very high entanglement molecular weights, greater than 200 kilograms per mole for the polymers that we studied. And such long entanglement molecular weights means that they're unentangled at any reasonable molecular weight. Uh, so this leads to low strength and elongation for these thermoplastic elastomers, as one might expect. And so one way we are looking to overcome this is to bring in supermolecular interactions in the matrix of these materials. Uh, so a, a traditional uh, thermoplastic elastomer, say a styrene, isoprene, styrene type material, uh, would be entangled in its matrix. Its, its uh, soft rubbery matrix would be entangled. And our sustainable thermoplastic elastomers, they're unentangled due to, due to the high entanglement molecular weights. And so can we use something like hydrogen bonding to improve the strength of the material? And just to show a proof of principle, uh, the, sam the photos on the bottom, on the left-hand side, you can see uh, a, at a particular composition, we had a very brittle material. It was even difficult to process to do mechanical testing. And the only thing we changed was to add a functional group for hydrogen bonding, which then allowed us to make a very easily processable, processable elastomeric material. And so this is an area that we're, we're currently uh, exploring. And that leads me to uh, another question uh, as we move into the next section of my talk where I'm going to highlight the feature of biodegradability of polymers that can be derived from vegetable oils. And so the question for you is what percentage of plastics produced in the United States are actually recycled? All right, and would that be 5%, 9%, 21%, or 32%? And once again, you're all answering very quickly, so I'm going to close this poll and uh, give Megan the results in five, four, three, two, one. <clears throat> all right, and it looks like 43% uh, of our audience, which was the largest there, said 9%, and the next size was 35%, which said that 5% were recycled. All right, well, you guys are spot on. Uh, it turns out uh, in the United States, 9% of plastics are recycled. Uh, that number is a little bit higher for something like PET, uh, which has a dedicated recycling stream, uh, many companies working to find useful products for the recycled material, that percent might be higher in the 20 to 30 percent range, but overall it's 9 percent. And there are many reasons for this. Uh, uh, the fact that the polymer properties are downgraded upon recycling, uh, also consumer participation, uh, but another reason uh, that we don't can't recycle everything we produce uh, in terms of polymeric materials is that some classes are not recyclable, such as thermoset polymers or elastomers. And so that brings me to the, the next topic, which is can we take advantage of biodegradable functional groups, such as those pres present in oils, to make biodegradable polymers, uh, which are not just the traditional thermoplastics. Uh, and so we've been focusing on thermosets as a class uh, where we would ideally like to create degradable or biodegradable materials. And so we focused on the use of epoxy resins, which are uh, materials that are applied in broad applications ranging from composites to adhesives to coatings. Uh, they have really attractive properties of high modulus and strength and chemical resistance. And in this case, we wanted to replace the traditional bisphenol A derived monomer uh, with a sustainable monomer, uh, which could help reduce the use of toxic materials, employ sustainable components, and ideally provide a route for de degradable materials in this uh, non-traditional class of, of thermosets. And so in our study, we used epoxidized soybean oil, shown on the slide, to replace the diglycidyl ether of bisphenol A, or DGEBA. 
In either case, the monomer was cured with a curing agent, which could be an amine or an anhydride. And we did a very simple experiment, which is to look at the hydrolytic degradation behavior in a basic solution. So this is an accelerated experiment at elevated temperature and 3% NOH. And we look at the mass loss over time. And we found epoxy resins, which contained uh, just the traditional DGEBA monomer, uh, didn't degrade up to, we even looked up to as long as three months in that basic solution. And we even increased the base concentration at 10 weight percent. Uh, however, if we used a uh, vegetable oil-based uh, material, epoxidized soybean oil, it degraded within a matter of two weeks in the 3% base solution. And then we used intermediate amounts of, of both the DGBA and ESO, and the degradation uh, rate uh, then varied accordingly. Uh, another look at this is just uh, camera images of the materials, the DGBA-based epoxy resin, essentially not changing up to as long as three months, just some surface changes on the material. And we see the disappearance of the vegetable oil-based material on the top. All right, so uh, why not just use these oils uh, as uh, monomers for epoxy resins? Well, they're very flexible molecules, and so we do see uh, a associated loss in the glass transition temperature, as well as the modulus and other properties. On the other hand, they do improve the, the epoxy resin toughness, but the, the loss in the TG and modulus do uh, limit the potential applications for vegetable oil-derived epoxy resins. And so we were interested um, in finding a way to use this information to develop uh, so sustainable sources for epoxy resins, which can give us the ability to degrade the material, but also maintain mechanical properties during the service lifetime. And so I'm moving just very quickly away from vegetable oils as a source for just the next two slides, just to tell you quickly about our use of plant-based phenolic acids. Uh, phenolic acids are a diverse array of chemicals which have a phenolic ring, uh, carboxylic acid, and varying number of hydroxyl groups. And we used uh, a selected number of these uh, sources for uh, epoxy resin components. Uh, they're found in various fruit and vegetable sources and also can be found in waste products of the agricultural industry. Uh, so we used uh, two phenolic acids, we epoxidized them, and then we reacted them with a curing agent to form epoxy resins. And what we found was that the mechanical behavior uh, rivaled that of the conventional material based on bisphenol A. Uh, so we saw a very uh, high modulus, high uh, tensile strength, and also a comparable TG to the traditional material. Uh, however, when we put our uh, phenolic acid-based epoxy resin in the basic solution, we find again that it is degradable, um, a, a similar rate to that as what we saw for the vegetable oil derived materials. And so in this case, we can actually have the best of both worlds. All right, one last uh, topic uh, that I wanted to just touch on is uh, looking at uh, oils as plastic additives. And in this case, I'm highlighting features that they're non-toxic, so they can replace uh, some of the additives like plasticizers that people are concerned about for health concerns. And, they're actually have, and they also have low volatility, which makes them good uh, choices for additives and plastics. And in our case, we uh, looked at polylactide uh, and improving its toughness through the addition of oils. Uh, Steve's talked a little bit about polylactide in his talk, and I'll mention that another uh, limitation of this material, which limits its uh, widespread uh, applicability, is its brittleness. So it has a very low elongation and break, uh, tensile toughness, impact strength. Uh, and I show the sun chips bag because a while back, uh, this material was used for as uh, compostable material for sun chips bags, but it was pulled off the out of the market pretty quickly for that application because the chips kept uh, breaking holes uh, through the bags uh, during transportation. And so uh, what we have studied, been studying uh, for a number of years is the use of vegetable oils uh, to improve the toughness of PLA. Uh, I'll note that there's a lot of work on epoxidized, hydroxylated, and oxidized oils that tend to plasticize PLA. Uh, and they do increase the toughness quite a bit, but you also usually see an associated loss on the glass transition temperature. Uh, with Mark Hillmeyer, I worked on the use of unmodified soybean oil and also castor oil as additives for polylactide. And in both cases, uh, they're highly immiscible, so a very low amount of the oil will improve the uh, toughness without a loss of TG. But in the case of soybean oil, uh, there is a phase inversion that occurs, and uh, you get a loss of uh, a large fraction of the oil from the PLA. And in the case of castor oil, it's not widely available in the US, and also there are some processing issues in terms of uh, 
uh, uh, human health concerns. And so our goal here was to develop a widely available oil-based modifier for PLA, which increases toughness without plasticization. And very quickly, we, we were focused on the use of acrylated epoxidized soybean oil. This contains hydroxyl groups, which can allow us to form compatibilizers or even undergo in situ compatibilization. It contains acrylate groups, which can be cross-linked in order to tune the oil phase properties. And it's highly immiscible with PLA, which avoids plasticization. And the short story here is that through the uh, use of AESO uh, as a modifier and also the addition of a compatibilizer that we designed as a star polymer with an AUS, AESO core and PLA arms, we were able to increase the toughness of PLA by about a factor of six and elongation of break by an order of magnitude. All right, so uh, in conclusion, vegetable oils have very desirable features as polymer sources. I have discussed, uh, they have convenient functional groups. The polymers that are produced have tunable properties. There are, they can be biodegradable, uh, non-toxic, have low volatility and worldwide availability. And there's just a few considerations I wanted to leave you with when thinking about uh, biorenewable polymers. So uh, if we're, even if we're looking at a source like uh, a, a vegetable oil, uh, we still must think about the full life cycle, things, uh, processing, energy, water, chemical requirements, end of life fate, byproducts that are produced. And of course, cost is going to be an important factor in the actual practical use of such materials. Uh, finally, uh, it would be desirable to avoid competition with food sources. I like to show uh, these images from, uh, from NatureWorks regarding the use of polylactide, though the current sources are uh, food-based. There are many uh, possibilities in development which can move away from food. And in the case of vegetable oils, we could think about algae as a source for triglycerides, uh, which in theory could be grown in uh, wastewater. Uh, so at this, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the students in particular who worked on this project, our collaborators, and our funding sources. And at the end of the slides, for those of you who have the handout, uh, I do have a few um, review articles on sustainable polymers, on polymers from vegetable oils, uh, and some of the articles I mentioned from our research group. And at this point, I'd like to hand it over to Mark for the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Megan. Uh, another outstanding presentation, very interesting uh, materials. And I've been receiving questions uh, throughout from uh, both uh, presentations, uh, but people online are welcome to continue to ask questions that have come up since that time uh, in the question box uh, on, the, on the webinar uh, framework. Um, so I'm gonna uh, start, uh, and we're gonna go back to uh, Steve's uh, presentation. And Steve, uh, we're gonna start with a couple uh, questions uh, for you. Um, and the first is from Gordon, and it's about the polymers that are designed for hydrolysis. And in some examples, uh, Gordon talks about uh, when the molecular weight gets low enough, uh, you start to get crystallinity. And then that crystallinity in the materials of the oligomers, let's say, maybe in isotactic PLA, um, are then resistant to degradation. So one question is, is that you know an issue with your materials and how do you combat that? And the second question is, is that um, when people put glycolide, for example, in PLA, that can speed up uh, hasten the degradation. Are there strategies there that you might have to talk about with respect to cre increasing the hydrophilicity of the material? All right. Well, thank you for those questions. Uh, and by the way, <clears throat> Megan, very well done. Nice presentation. Uh, regarding the degradation, these are these are complicated processes. We've we've realized that things that happen with small molecules are certainly different for for polymers. My take on the slow step is the ability to get water, in the case of water degradation, water into the polymer. So polymers that are very hydrophobic, it doesn't really matter if there is a weak link built into them. If the polymers don't absorb water, that will be overall a slow degradation process. So uh, I think one is correct in noting that they need, there needs to be a hydrophilic component in the polymer to to essentially get some bimolecular collisions between water and your, in your, in this case, your ester group. Anyway, we recently published a paper uh, where we included pyrrolidinone rings in the polymer backbone. So pyrrolidinones are molecules that are known to be quite usually water soluble, and by putting those into the polymer backbone, you greatly facilitate the uh, the 
uh, adsorption of water into the bulk material, not just the surface, but apparently the bulk. Once that happens, the polymers maybe after a month begin to swell, uh, they turn into a gel, and then over the course of a year they hydrolyze, even though they have ester bonds in them that look pretty much like the ester bonds of PLA, that is uh, an ester bond with one alpha carbon-based substituent. So sterically, they look about like PLA, but because they can take on water, um, they uh, have drastically increased degradation rates. Great, thank you, Steve. Um, another question, um, which is more related to uh, the topic on 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 vanillin, uh, two people asked, Sophie and Calvin, are interested in how do you know? Can you talk about or do you know any efforts on how to improve? the yield of vanillin when decomposing lignin? Is this an active area of research? And can you give us any insight on how that situation might be improved to get higher volumes at lower cost? So for vanillin, what I have learned is that Beauregard is kind of stuck at about 1% yield from the bulk okay. lignin material. So there's there's a limitation there because there's only so much you can do to to fragment this very complicated lignin material. The alternative strategy has to do with going to molecules like ferulic acid, which are not really part of lignin. They are uh, usually more often used as crosslinkers between bundles of lignin and cellulose in the lignocellulose matrix. So they tend to be, um, when you look at the structure, they're they're more it's more they're more obviously removed. So you can take ferulic acid and rhodia solve. A, uh, European company takes this molecule and they subject it to a biotransformation which performs a carbon-carbon bond cleavage at the double bond and transforms ferulic acid into vanillin which was, was essentially the reverse of the Perkin reaction that I mentioned during my talk. So people are interested in taking ferulic acid and valorizing that to what they call and what is labeled as natural vanillin even though the vanillin from Beauregard comes from trees, it's a very chemical intensive process, and so it doesn't have the same authorization as being natural. Um, so there are efforts by companies to sell vanillin from ferulic acid, and they charge about $1,000 per kilo for this and sell it to what I can imagine uh, very expensive chocolatiers in Europe. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Megan, we're going to turn to uh, a couple questions uh, for you. Um, let's start with uh, with this one. You talked a little bit, about, this is from Jennifer, you talked a little bit about um, entanglements in some of your materials, the acrylates, uh, leading to relatively uh, uh, low strength. And um, have you looked at all any of those for pressure sensitive adhesive applications? Because sometimes the high entanglement molar mass uh, leads to attractive properties for, for PSAs. Is that something you're interested in or have looked at? Uh, yes, that's a great question. And in fact, uh, we have not studied uh, these uh, pressure sensitive adhesives from this type of material, but uh, there's a nice article from Kevin Kaviki at University of Akron where they did exactly that, where they use uh, this type of long chain uh, polyacrylate. And uh, you, you can take advantage of that side chain crystallization and that those accessible melting temperatures, which can really be tuned uh, to whatever temperature you want to use for a particular process. So though it's not something that our group has done, it's, it's definitely an area of interest uh, for application of these kind of materials. Great, thank you. Um, Philip is interested in your vegetable oil, oil work, but as it relates to a particular application, um, so like alkyds and other oil-based paints, do you know much about how vegetable oils have been used in emulsion polymerization for making paints? Uh, is that something that uh, you have kept track of or are doing in your research group or can comment on? Uh, yeah, so I, I haven't focused a lot in that area, but, but you're exactly right when you mentioned the alkyds, which are oil-based, and so certainly uh, this is still, these are still um, materials that are being used commercially, uh, but I can't really say too much more about uh, where that field is going at this moment as, I, as I, I'm not working in that area. But presumably, I guess, if you're making the acrylates and they ultimately could be put in emulsion systems, you have a chance of in including them into, into paint type formulations. Absolutely, yeah. Actually, I should, one thing I, I forgot to mention in my talk is, uh, you know, the we've been using controlled radical polymerization techniques right. uh, and certainly free radical polymerization is also uh, just as applicable to this class of materials. So there's really no reason you couldn't use these uh, fatty acid drive uh, long chain acrylates and, and those types of emulsion uh, polymerizations. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go back now uh, to Steve. Uh, Steve, this question is from Chip. 
Uh, Chip's interested in investigating other hydrogen bond donors or acceptors in your, your vinyl acid towel. Uh, I, I presume this is for the modified polyvinyl alcohol. Have you looked how the side chains with some donors and sectors, not, not unrelated to what Megan said about some super molecular interactions in her materials, have you looked at that in any of your materials uh, and how they might influence TG or properties in general? So in principle, you could put far more complicated units in the backbone and attach things that do have sort of these uh, uh, multi-hydrogen bond uh, connectors. Um, we haven't done that. We, we've mostly focused on molecules that nature will give us, sometimes reluctantly, but nonetheless natural in, in, their, in their origin. So we haven't worked at, looked at more complicated structures. I, I will also note that since our acetalizations only fit range in the 50, 60, 70%, there is always a, a, a large number of OH groups remaining from the original polyvinyl alcohol in the backbone. So that's something that we, we just have to keep track of and that's always there. But we haven't really looked at things more complicated. We actually want to try things that are simpler than, and in principle cheaper than what we've tried. But uh, I think there is room to look into those other types of components, maybe even if they're only present in a, a small amount, they may have a big effect. Right. Yep. Yeah. Um, here's a, here's a tough question, uh, Steve. Um, this is from Amelia. Uh, uh, she asks, "Is one to ten years, or, or what is the right time frame for uh, aqueous degradation? Is that sufficiently fast? Uh, would this leave still, you know, what would it be? <laughs> this is a tough question. What would the equilibrium amount of plastic in the ocean after that? But I guess more generally, do, do you do you have a sense of the type of time frame you're really looking for in terms of the degradation of these uh, aqueous degradable materials? So I view it as a steady state analysis, and I haven't done complete math on it because uh, the numbers for our addition to plastics in the ocean aren't aren't fantastic yet. But you essentially want the degradation to occur at the same rate that we're adding. And at the same time, you don't want your water bottle on the shelf to disintegrate. You, you would like a shelf life, I'm imagining, of 10 years before something drastic happens. Um, of course, that changes if you're storing water with pH zero versus Pepsi of two pH of 2.5. So there are uh, different applications. We actually consider a couple of applications where they can be very hydrolytically sensitive, but um, are stored uh, prior to use in hermetically sealed packages. An example of this would be a syringe. So hmm. apparently there are, there are uh, billions of syringes produced every year, typically out of polyethylene. There's no reason they need to be polyethylene. They all arrived in a hermetically sealed package. So you could exclude water, make it out of, out of a very hydrolytically susceptible polymer, and then after use, who cares if it degrades because you're only going to use this for a couple of minutes before you throw it away. Right. There are certain applications where it makes sense to make them extremely sensitive. Um, but in terms of just balancing the, the plastics in the ocean, it, it's got to be faster than a thousand years, which is basically what polyethylene probably right, is. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Megan, uh, a couple more questions coming in uh, for you as well. Um, uh, Titania is interested in your epoxy resins that you showed wind turbines and, and automobile automotive applications. Um, but the polymer is also uh, degradable. So this is kind of a twofold question. Um, would you, I mean, these are useful for, as, as as she puts it, heavy-duty performance applications, but they're also degradable. So uh, what what is the interplay there that you, you think about in your research with respect to either triggering degradation or just its durability and use? Do you have any comment on that? Uh, yes, yeah, that's a great question. And that's probably somewhat of a controversial viewpoint, but because I do think that making degradable uh, but yet more durable materials is, is important. Uh, when you think about all of the composite waste that ends up in landfills or must be incinerated. Uh, and so the, the ideal situation would be to have something that, that does not impact the performance during its lifetime, which, you know, for it could be quite a long time for a car or a wind turbine, but that after the useful lifetime, we can then uh, degrade the material in the right conditions. And I think what Steve mentioned regarding polylactide is actually not a bad situation where you know, in, in his backyard, it doesn't degrade, but you put it in an industrially managed compost under the right conditions, and eventually it will degrade. And that's the type of thing we would want to do for these applications as well. So whether the esters and the oils are the right chemistry for that, um, you know, I think that could definitely be improved on something 
may be that even is triggered by uh, more of a chemical degradation process is certainly possible. Uh, but at least it's a starting point that shows us that this type of thermoset material uh, can be degraded under the right conditions. Thank you. Um, this question is from, from Marzio. Um, what about kind of traditional synthetic uh, thermoset rubbers, just your normal chemically cross-linked rubbers? Any, any chance to get those from bio-derived materials or do you have an interest in that, uh, you know, something other than thermoplastic elastomers? Uh, sure. In fact, uh, you know, the unsaturated fatty acids and vegetable oils could be subjected to the same types of cross-linking chemistries to make elastomers. Uh, it's not something that we've worked on as of yet, but there's certainly a lot of interest in that area. Um, and I should point out that uh, natural rubber is, uh, you know, an elastomer that's uh, been around for a long time. That sure, is right. Mm -hmm. By renewable source. Um, Okay, I'm going to finish uh, the question and answer session here with a question for both of you, and it's a question that I've often uh, struggled with and thought about in my own research, but it's, it's stimulated by a question from Philip, who says, how much fossil fuel energy and other energy is involved in the manufacturing process of biodegradable and, and PLA materials? I mean, the, the answer for PLA materials is I can, I, I know there are many published studies on kind of the full life cycle analysis uh, for PLA, so one can go to the literature to get the answer for that. But the question that I struggle with, Steve, uh, is is when do you start to evaluate LCA in terms of a exploratory basic research projects like you, you and Megan have presented? Um, when do you think about LCA and how important is that in your uh, is that in your research and in your thinking? So we do think about this a lot. Um, we don't have uh, highly sophisticated quantitative analyses, uh, interpretations of it or a viewpoint. But um, one of the things, as you can tell from my talk, is we're very interested in degradation. And this is one of the components that is usually not addressed. Uh, it would be nice if everyone had a 100% recycling rate, as, as Megan pointed out, in the US, this is 9%. In the Europe, if this is governed by law. And so in, in, in some countries, certain polymers are recycled at about a 99%. I don't necessarily advocate for that. So what I assume is that the consumer will take the polymer and throw it in the ditch. That is my my basic assumption. And knowing that, I include that in my life cycle analysis, and I realize that cleaning up a ditch, or even worse, the ocean, is going to be by far the most expensive component on a per kilogram basis of the entire life cycle. So that is probably the part of the life cycle that I consider first. Uh, and that is, I do I do consider degradation to be an integral part of it. Um, and I have seen life cycle analyses that say polypropylene is the greenest plastic on earth. Right. Sure, it comes from fossil fuels, but it, it's been so optimized over 50 years that it is the cheapest to produce and it's very efficient. That doesn't account for scooping up floating polypropylene from the ocean by the kilogram covering thousands upon thousands of square miles. It simply doesn't include that cost. If it did, there is no way it would be the cheapest plastic. Our plastics, if they go in the ocean and disintegrate in 10 years, has a zero remediation cost. So there are different ways to think about the life cycle analysis and where to end it. I end it when it turns back into CO2. Right, right, interesting. Megan, have you thought about this life cycle? I'm sure you have, life cycle analysis issue. And kind of when when do you start you know, taking it more seriously with respect to starting new projects and, and starting some of the development and discovery work that you talked about today? Uh, yeah, actually, this is something we've thought about quite a bit. Uh, we have not initiated this, uh, but as part of the uh, NSF funding for our work, we actually have some plans to, to look at life cycle analyses. And I mean, on a small level, we can think about this every day when we design a certain chemical route and try to avoid a tox more toxic route versus a more benign route or try to use a solvent-free chemistry and, and et cetera. So, so I think on a daily basis, we can actually try to employ the green chemistry principles and, and development of these materials. But in terms of trying to evaluate their impact, um, I agree this is very important. Uh, it's not a zero-sum game, and there is probably a trade-off. Even in the case of PLA, the literature is quite diverse on this issue and controversial and, and in conflict with one another. Uh, and, so, and so there is... Uh, you know, there are things like energy requirements and chemicals for processing that can have a big impact on the overall environmental impact of that material. So I think uh, from a developmental standpoint, we, we need to think about it even from the beginning uh, of a research project. 